to the album man and sorry this last of the Halloween albums is a bit late I know it's the 5th of November now remember remember the 5th of November gunpowder trees and plot but um yeah I, I still want to finish the Halloween thing unfortunately it's been late going to Damnation Festival other concerts etc other stuff so yeah anyway I, I still want to do it so this is a review of the crazy world of Arthur Brown by the crazy world of Arthur Brown and to me, this really is the definitive rock, scary album. I mean, this is the god of Hellfire himself, Arthur Brown, and his debut albums. If you don't know who Arthur Brown is, he is, uh, well, is and was a British um, performer of heavy psychedelic rock in the late 60s, and he was discovered by the Who guitarist Pete Townsend. And along with Kit Lambert, they produced his debut album, released in 1968. And Arthur Brown is still performing to this day with his latest album, Zim Zam Zom, which was crowdfunded and released earlier this year. And I, in fact, I'm going to see him um, later on this week, I think on uh, Friday, I'm going to see him live. So that should be really um, cool. Looking forward to that. It might be the second time I saw him. I saw him in 2013 at um, Hard Rock House Prog Festival as well. And he's a fantastic, fantastic performer. His performance has certainly gained him a lot of notoriety in the 60s. Um, he was one of the first people to start wearing face paints and he had a, well, still has a helmet with fire on it and loads of theatrics and certainly was one of the original shock rock personas definitely setting the blueprint for artists like Alice Cooper and Marilyn Manson who both acknowledge Arthur Brown as an influence to them and really has more stage presence and energy than acts that are less than half his age so let's look at the king of scare the god of hellfire and see why this is a landmark album in rock music in my opinion that really everyone should own so this album was actually originally intended to be a rock opera about hell, but producer Kit Lambert wanted it to be a bit more commercial. So instead of compromise was reached of half of it being the intended hell rock opera, and the other half a collection of songs they've been performing live, originals and covers. So the fair side, this focuses on the horrors of hell, this is the conceptual part of the album. So it begins with Prelude's Nightmare, and what is different immediately about Arthur's music from his psychedelic contemporaries is the lack of guitar and bass. Instead, with very much a focus on uh, organs from Vincent Crane, who was writing credits on many of the songs, was a key, key member and very much crucial to making this album what it was. And also what's immediately recognisable is the distinct voice of Arthur himself as he shrieks and screams in falsetto in a rather demented, maniacal way, creating insanity as he paints this dark picture of hell. The really the heart of this album is Fire Poem leading into Fire. Um, without a shadow of a doubt, this is one of the pinnacles, in my opinion, of 60s music, and particularly of psychedelia. It really is incredible. First of Fire Poem, we have Arthur Brown, not singing, but talking, reciting this well, fire poem in a way only he could do with shrieks as it gets more and more dramatic as the character seems to fall into hell itself and very, very much reminiscent of something like a Dante's Inferno and the various circles of hell and it feels like Arthur Brown's taking you down a trip down the circles of hell. And this leads into fire and this is a bona fide classic, number one in the UK and number two single in the US, selling over one million copies as a single. This was big back in 1968. I mean, anyone from the time, I imagine, will remember this organ-driven, insanely catchy, slightly disconcerting and disturbing piece. And the song will contain no real guitars, as, in fact, there's no guitars aside from bass on this entire album. There's no guitars to the Crazy World of Arthur. I mean, there is in the modern live shows, but at the time there wasn't. Though even without guitar, I would still classify this as one of the precursors to metal music with its dark themes and um, vocal intensity and even musical intensity, particularly towards the end as he screams burn and it echoes and reverbs and again, another maniacal laugh. It's just a ridiculously catchy piece of music and something I often find myself listening to. And then next we have Come and By, and this takes the album in perhaps an even darker direction. We lose the sort of theatrical wails of the previous song, but instead gain this ominous croon for most of the song. This track is a real progressive rock age, with Vincent Crane's organ dominating the piece, providing some of the most wonderful organ melodies I've heard with orchestral accompaniment, which actually apparently was to hide the drumming, which was meant to be a little bit out of time. 
and the drums are actually very low in the mix on this album. And the best part really is just how it builds to a huge crescendo with all the instruments coming to a head as Arthur unleashes his banshee-like wails again. This song creates a fantastic atmosphere, very interesting gothic lyrics and strong melodies. The Time of Confusion, this is really the last song of the Hell concept, and it's a far subtler song with a prominent glockenspiel, which is always kind of cool, um, with the almost whispered, half-sung spoken words from Arthur. This is there was something very brooding, very ominous and mysterious about this track, really. There's a definite, I would honestly say, sort of a dreamlike nature to it. Though maybe it might be appropriate to say more of a nightmare vibe, as the second part of the song Confusion has a jazzy vibe to it, honestly, leading into the first half's um, finale as a reprise of fire with terrifying cackles and shrieks as if a demon had possessed Arthur's body, and it really is bloody great. Honestly, part of me wishes the entire album was actually based around the concept of hell and they really expanded on this because I think it would have been absolutely fascinating but that's not to say I don't like side two especially when side two opens with one of the greatest covers I've ever had in my life Arthur Brown's version of I Put a Spell on You by Screaming Jay Hawkins who is the original howling blues man and very much an inspiration on the shock rock style in his vocal performances and the way that Crane and Brown have arranged the version of this classic, it's fresh, interesting and powerful, while still keeping that bluesy, soulful nature, as Brown puts in quite possibly his career-defining vocal performance, showcasing the passion and breadth of his vocal range, and definitely a very soulful performance. Again, it just really shows the variety of styles off Brown has managed, can manage to do. A truly unique voice, without a doubt, full of charm, personality, and Arthur Brown to me is very much a quintessentially British persona. And live also, this song is excellent, and he can somehow still sing it, even though he's in his 70s now. Though Spontaneous Apple Creation is definitely the most experimental piece on this album, it's very much sort of acid rock, and a trippy experience that even might have made Zappa wonder what the living heck was going on. This song, it's near impossible to describe, if I'm going to be quite honest, so I really won't try. All I'm going to say is basically it's a fascinating, innovative and ahead of its time song. I mean, it's not going to be to everyone's taste, of course, but you can say that with basically any song. But particularly, this is a, a niche song for real fans of acid rock and 60s psychedelia, as others may find it just that bit too bizarre, but I really like psychedelia and that type of thing, and I just love how weird and wacky it is, and to me, that is what Arthur does better than anyone else. Though, this is followed by Rest Cure, which is often acknowledged by critics to be the weakest track on the album, and I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, it's a harmless 60s ditty that really just lacks any bite that makes the rest of the album so exciting, so memorable, it's a very forgettable track, a weak melody, and it just feels extremely out of place on a song full of such interesting themes and or covers and experimental stuff and proto-prog and proto-metal as well, and this is just very generic. I've Got No Money, I cover the James Brown song, it's again something you might not necessarily expect Arthur Brown to cover, and while well, throughout there's definitely a lot of uh, jazz Influence. I mean, you can see jazz influence across this album, but of course, um, mostly with this song. This is definitely the most distinctively jazzy song, with the drumming being the, really the only prominent drum performance on the album. Though, it really is Crane who steals the show here with his prog-influenced organ. I mean, this song has been done many, many times, but to me, this is the definitive acid version, adding a ferocity that only break, um, Crane and Brown um, craft, and how with only bass guitar, drums and organ they do this, I'm quite unsure, but they somehow manage to. Then Child of My Kingdom, and this comes along and definitely ends the album, I'd say, in a rather unexpected way, as well as tendency is a proto-prog here, I wasn't expecting a seven-minute proto-prog song that showcases many of the elements that really would come to be staples of 70s prog, with clear jazz influence again, changing pace, it's an astonishing piece of music with a combination of a very strong melody, and best of all, some whistling, just like Wind of Change. And you can definitely tell where Crane was snapped up by Atomic Rooster, which featured Carl Palmer, who did actually drum on the tour um, that preceded, um, sorry, not preceded, that was um, after this album's release. Again, his keys are extraordinary on this song, of course. Brown's vocal was also 
you know, remarkable as well. But definitely it needs to be highlighted how important Crane was. And while Arthur Brown makes some interesting music after this, to me, this release is Milestone album. This was the definitive album that he made, and Vincent Crane was a massive and very underlooked part of that, I often feel. To me, yeah, here Arthur managed to influence shock rock, heavy metal, and prog, as well as being innovative and define the psychedelic era. Him and Crane achieved so much on this record. To me, it really still holds up to this day as a classic. Just end-to-end -end zaniness, horror-filled enjoyment, and live, the man is still one of the best live acts going without a word of exaggeration. So for me, I'm going to give this album a 9 out of 10. It's just up my alley, one of the best, if not the best, psychedelic album of the late 60s. Absolutely fantastic. So this Halloween review is a bit late, but still, I, I wanted to cover this album. It's just wonderful, whatever time of the year it is. This has been the album, man. Thanks for watching. Comment, subscribe, and as usual, long live fucking rock.